So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the uh, presentation. We're starting off with the overall Grand Challenge research um, justifications, what are the challenges we're looking at, um, how the Grand Challenge is structured. We'll then move on to the um, initial case study, um, where Steve will take over to talk about the Toyota point of view and the larger research area that they're carrying out. And then we'll go into the Loughborough area, where we, how we're involved with the Toyota larger project and talk about the initial results we've had from this case study and how we're intending to progress in the future. So why is there a need for zero waste in manufacturing? Why is it an important strategic goal? Well, current levels of um, waste in manufacturing are unsustainable. This is due to inefficiency of current recycling technologies and processes, and as a result, we're losing a lot of valuable resources. There's also very little support of uh, the waste flow modeling at a supply chain level in manufacturing. And at present, many companies don't actually consider the environmental impact of their waste management options. So as long as the waste is being taken away, that's good enough for them. The grand challenge, uh, zero waste in manufacturing, has been split down into three sub-areas. This is technology, modeling, and management. For the technology side of things, we're looking to develop new recycling technologies to improve recycling and the recycler quality to increase value recovery. For the modeling side of things, we're creating novel methods uh, for modeling and visualizing waste across a manufacturing supply chain. And for the management side of things, we're investigating and generating simplistic tools and methods for assessment, uh, for environmental assessment, sorry, um, of the various waste management options that companies are using. This particular presentation is concentrating on the technology sub-project, um, on the Toyota case study for semi-automated robotic disassembly for ELV components for extraction of critical materials. I'll just hand you over to Steve now to give you the Toyota point of view from this project. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Michael said, we're just going to take you through uh, the reasons why we wanted to embark on this project. Um, as you'll be aware, Toyota was one of the uh, uh, prime movers of uh, hybrid technology into, uh, into the vehicle market. And the market share of those hybrid vehicles has been steadily increasing over the last 15 years. And uh, now we are actually producing 13 different hybrid models uh, for our market. These vehicles uh, are a little bit of a paradox. We're trying to make them more environmentally friendly. But actually, in doing so, we have to use materials which are not so common, so-called rare earth materials and other critical raw materials which are, are uh, specified by the European Union. And because we use more of those, it's highlighting really the need for us to uh, consider our recycling strategy when those vehicles become end of life. And we had a particular opportunity in this area to really test out the latest technology and what sort of performance can we actually achieve against the end of life vehicle directive, but also against our own challenging targets when we had an opportunity to uh, scrap a number of vehicles which were prototype vehicles and needed to be scrapped off uh, <coughs> uh, because of uh, the law within Europe. So we were actually able to gather together in one location 165 identical vehicles and this enabled us to do a uh, rather unique uh, sort of tri trial shall we say in this area. So we uh, scouted around looking for some partners and one of the restrictions was that we actually had to scrap these vehicles in uh, Belgium because this is the uh, country of importation. Uh, Toyota Europe is actually based in Europe. So with ourselves we found a group which is called the Comet Sabre Group at, uh, um, in, in the Wallon area of Belgium and they are uh, specialists in automotive depollution and they, as you will see, are presented themselves as very good partners in this area. We also uh, combined with Umicor, a company that you may be familiar with, uh, but they are large-scale precious metal uh, recyclers, again based in Belgium. And uh, through the centre, we were able to uh, gladly offer the opportunity for Loughborough to join in with one of these areas. So what we were trying to find from our own perspective was to understand the, comp the different ways in which we can actually uh, dismantle a car. So we wanted really to make a comparative study between three particular methods. So the three approaches are listed there. The first approach is to just take the car 
and depollute it in the normal way according to the law, but then to drop it into a shredder and then use post-shredder technology to try and separate out the materials so that they can be recycled. The second approach was to do a bit of pre-dismantling. What I mean by that is actually to select certain components and uh, uh, separate those from the mainstream of the vehicle. This would hopefully uh, concentrate those materials that we were after, um, but actually both streams would go through individual shredder streams. So the vehicle would, no would go through the normal shredder stream, but maybe the electronic components, for example, would go through a much smaller shredder process to try and extract those materials. And the third approach was which w the area in which we were trying to encourage uh, um, Loughborough to, to take part in was where we would actually selectively uh, dismantle the vehicle for those uh, target components and again we would then uh, pass those to Loughborough and then Loughborough would actually try some robotic disassembly to try a and again keep the concentration as high as possible. So you can see on the right hand side as, as we go down the, the page actually the potential for keeping the quality of the uh, material, the highest concentration of those uh, target materials is gained as we go down the, the, down the list. But increasingly as we go down that list of course more labour goes in there and more processing as well. This is a typical uh, type of shredding activity that you would see and our uh, uh, <coughs> uh, partners, Comet Sabra Group, were able to do all of the three stages as you can see there. The first stage was done by their subsidiary called Resicar, where we actually take the vehicle, secure it from a safety point of view, discharge the battery, etc., depollute the vehicle, that means taking oils and fluids out of the vehicle to comply with the law, and then we did an additional step there where we might separate certain materials. So, for example, hybrid batteries, they went to Umicore for uh, uh, treatment. Uh, fluids and catalysts, they go for uh, standard pr pr procedures for uh, disposal and recycling. And then the third step was the unique portion where we targeted certain components within the car. Where we've got the word ECU there, we mean electronic control units. So these are devices with uh, high concentration of uh, electronic items. The transaxles and the uh, um, hybrid components have the magnets in, uh, which uh, have some of the uh, rare earth materials and certain plastics we were going to take out as well. Then Comet Sabra would put them through the normal shredding procedure and then uh, uh, Comet Treatments, which is their post-shredder technology, as PST as it says there, uh, was able to um, eliminate um, certain metals from that treatment um, <coughs> and separate those out. Plastics uh, could be separated out and also uh, some mineral uh, sections which could go into uh, uh, things like road construction, etc. Two uh, areas where they were able to actually try and push technology forward as well is a, 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 a project that they've got called, uh, it's a pilot plant called Phoenix. Phoenix is actually using some of the organic materials and making a, a, a reusable or renewable fuel from that and actually they're using that to generate electricity which drives the shredder. And then uh, they've got another university project in uh, 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 Liège where they're working to do some biological treatment to actually extract uh, uh, rare earth and precious metals. So these were the results that we were able to get from the, uh, the normal shredding process and you can see here if you're familiar with the end of uh, life uh, um, re requirements for vehicles right now we have to achieve over 95% and you can see that between energy and uh, recycling we're well within that so we can demonstrate that today we are with today's technologies able to uh, recycle at an economic, uh, in an economic way over 95% of the vehicle. This graph here is uh, just some theoretical results, so please don't read into them too much because the, the system, the, the evaluation has changed over, over the time. But we evaluated the various different types of electronic control units that are within the car. As many people have said, there's more computing power now within a car than there was within the first moonshot. Uh, and there are many computers, and they're distributed all over the vehicle. So what we wanted to do was identify, actually, which were the ones that we should go for. And you could see there that on the left-hand side, there was two that really stuck out that we wanted to, uh, to uh, try and obtain uh, those, those parts, which is the driving support and the air conditioning unit. Uh, those were going to give us what we believed were to be the, the greatest value. 
And this research is still ongoing because actually by going through this process with the various partners, we've been able to identify where we can find additional value. So this is, is really adding to our knowledge of how to recycle cars. And I'll hand up back over to you, uh, okay. Michael. Okay. Thank you, Steve. So how does Loughborough fit into all of this? As Steve said, we take over onto the third approach, the larger Toyota project. Now, with this, we're aiming to use new technologies and developing new methodologies, i.e. using uh, robotic techniques. As you can see here, we have some lovely photos on the left-hand side of our robot in the lab, um, where I will hopefully show you a, a nice video of this in the coming slides. The approach we took for using the robot was if the valuable components from the vehicle have been taken out, we can try and concentrate the um, valuable critical materials within these components um, by removing them. With the, we, we can do this <laughs> with the robot. We approach this in a three-stage step. So you might notice three so it seems to play a larger part of this process. The first stage with the robot, which doesn't actually involve the robot, was a manual, non-destructive disassembly of all the components involved. This was to identify the various levels um, of dismantling required, the times to dismantle, the construction of the actual component, and what material content it actually had. The second stage was using the robot to semi-automatically destroy, or uh, destructively disassemble <laughs> the components, <laughs> and to develop and implement the full automated processes. This was all based on the first stage information. So we obviously needed to know how the component was constructed before we could take it apart with the robot. The third stage was to use, um, uh, to validate the actual processes from the second step and, uh, and uh, then check the repeatability and make sure we could try and improve and optimize these processes. I'm now going to take you through each of these steps in a bit more detail and show you some of the components again in a bit more detail. Now the first step, again as I said, was to deduce the material content and manner of construction of the automotive parts. So on the left-hand side, although it's not very clear, we have the nine parts we um, were dismantling. From these, we decided to um, take, well, from information we gained from Toyota, we had a key area of um, elements we wanted to look at, mostly um, gold, silvers, aluminiums, um, as well as coppers and some rare earth material. From on the table here, you can see that the electronic control unit's total disassembly time um, varies from, in some cases, a minute and a half up to almost 50 minutes. So obviously, economically, getting someone to sit there all day and dismantle these might not always be feasible. Now, we needed to organize the components in, uh, value, in terms of value and disassembly ease. So as you can see here, we have a chart ranging the components from complex high value to simple low value. Um, once we'd categorized the components, we needed then to establish what minimum level of disassembly we needed in order to actually get the critical materials out in an effective way. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, we have a full picture of the GPS system. As you can see, it's quite a complicated piece of uh, uh, technology with a lot of different components, with the PCV boards, the um, printed circuit boards, being where the critical materials are located. Uh, typically being in the center of this component. So as you can imagine, trying to robotically disassemble this was not an easy task. So from the first stage um, information, we developed our secondary stage robotic programs. Um, this was all to liberate the printed circuit boards, or the majority of the printed circuit boards, from the components. This typically meant um, trialing each component individually, fixturing it to the robotic dismantling table, as we can see on the first picture there on the left, the components uh, strapped down with a number of uh, clamps, and then carrying out various um, processes, in this case using a circular saw, to cut out various parts and then hopefully extract the, rare, uh, the critical materials. Um, the robot can use, like I say, a circular saw. It also has uh, a milling tool as well as a finger gripper and a vacuum gripper. So based on these um, successful tests, we then tried to develop fully automated systems, uh, programs. Um, this allowed us to test out um, all the individual programs we've written before and make sure they actually all work in sequence. So here we have an example of a component that's gone through this process. 
um, in this first image here on the arrow on the left hand side, the component's been cut down the side. The black top lid has then been removed to reveal the PCB inside. These have then been removed separately using a vacuum gripper. And then lastly, the top piece of the um, white remaining component is removed to reveal again another circuit board underneath. Um, once this process was, uh, was completed, we decided to reassess the fixture of the tool to see if we could make it any better at the time, and then reconsidered the tool changes we carried out to actually achieve this program. So the results that we've got so far for this second stage um, are presented here on the right-hand side. These are unoptimized process times, and these are compared to the manual disassembly times. You might notice that uh, components T03 and T07 there have been crossed out. Um, as I mentioned before, there are quite a few challenges with robotic disassembly. For the uh, T03 AC unit, the material this was made out of was just too tough for the pneumatic tools we employ with the robot. We found that the tool wear um, was just too much compared to how much um, material we were getting back. So we didn't unfortunately manage to carry out full robotic disassembly for this component. For T07, the window regulator, we found after manual disassembly that there was no printed circuit boards inside and that the rare earth material magnets inside couldn't actually be dismantled using a robot. Um, as you can imagine, magnets, robots, it didn't quite work so well. <laughs> and also if you note um, down for the T08, the GPS system, we've actually got a time from manual disassembly of 47 minutes to five minutes automatic disassembly. Now, this isn't an entire dismantling procedure. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, and as you saw, the GPS system is very complex. And trying to fixture this into having a single fixturing position that the robot could then um, attack it, this uh, component from, didn't allow us enough maneuverability to access all the PCBs inside. Therefore, we had to do a compromise and remove as much material as we could from the single fixture position. As for the rest of the components, we had successful programs um, run. And as you can see, there's a range of different results with some um, re se severely reducing the manual disassembly time. Uh, for example, the driving support ECU came down from 15 minutes manual disassembly to 3.6 minutes unoptimized robotic disassembly. However, there were some issues um, with the program, mostly involving tool changes, which takes time to move from one position to another where the manual process is actually faster than the unoptimized robotic process. So for T06, you can see for the, the airbag ECU that it actually takes two and a half minutes compared to the one, point, one and a half minutes of uh, the manual disassembly. So moving on to the third stage, the validation and optimization stage. Based on the second stage results, we checked the repeatability. We ran each component 10 times and checked how many times the program ran successfully. Based on these 10 times, usually we got about seven out of 10 um, good results compared to three, um, not failures, but inconsistencies. Um, issues with fixturing was typically the cause where the component hadn't been fixtured quite correctly onto the platform and had moved, which meant when the robot came into process, the component it didn't quite move far enough down or cuts in slightly the wrong place. Um, as far as optimization, um, is being carried out. We're concentrating on three main areas. This is to decrease the overall processing time of the tool operations, so um, improving milling and sawing times. We're trying to reduce the amount of tool changes during the operation, so rather than sawing first, then removing um, the component lid with a, mil um, with a vacuum gripper, and then sawing again, we're seeing if we can do both sawing operations at the same time before doing any other processes. We're also looking to shorten any extraneous movements the robot's carrying out. So for our particular robot, as you can see hopefully on the top uh, left-hand photo there, there's a lot of pipes that come off the tools and uh, various other places on the robot. So as you can imagine, when this is moving around at uh, breakneck speeds, the pipes occasionally would get caught up in the mechanism itself and break. So we have to have rather large clearance moves to make sure this doesn't happen when the full process is being carried out. Um, hopefully, as we go forward, we can eliminate um, these larger movements and refine it down so we get the minimum uh, clearance needed. So now I'm going to sh uh, show a short video. It's uh, about a minute long, so it's not too bad. Hopefully it'll work. Of uh, the robot processing a simple component using a couple of the robotic tools. 
That was not a good start. <laughs> So I'll just talk you through as this robot's uh, happily processing away here. It's initially picking up a milling tool to remove the various screws on the component. This particular component has four screws, and therefore we need four milling operations. As we can see here, it's not a, f a particularly fast process. Due to the pneumatic nature of the tools, there's not a um, significant amount of torque behind the actual milling tool. Therefore, we have to go at a stepped process to make sure that the tool itself doesn't stop mid midway. As you saw there, uh, there were four screws, but I didn't feel you needed to see all four at once. Um, it's now replacing the tool and going to pick up the next, next tool to use for the next stage. This involves removing the, the lid from the uh, component and then removing the circuit board inside and separating, separating these out um, into individual waste streams. <laughs> and there we have it. <laughs> Robotic disassembly at its peak. Um, this is actually an unoptimized process, and the robot can actually move a lot faster than on the screen. The, the camera we had unfortunately blurred a lot um, when we were recording, so we had to slow it down a little bit. Um, as I said, we did cut three of the screws out there, which take about 15 seconds each. So this whole process actually takes about two and a half minutes to carry out. So to summarize, stage one and stage two have been completed. Stage three is now fully underway, where we're trying to optimize the robotic processes as much as possible. The overall results are pretty encouraging, with many of the um, automated processes unoptimized are either equal to or better than the manual disassembling times. However, as I said, we've got had many challenges along the way, um, mostly with the robotic tool and fixturing design and implementation. We've also had issues with components, material design and complexity, with some of these components actually using particularly strong glues and rubber seals, which made it very difficult to actually separate one part from another. We also actually have to, again, consider the physical limitations of the robot itself. Because it uses a pneumatic system, the pipes, as I said, get in the way quite a lot. For future work, we're again hoping to complete this project to incorporate, include it with the larger Toyota study. And then combining all that together, we will hopefully get some really informative information whether robotic processing is the way forward, as we suspect it might be. Um, we're also aiming to explore more precise and flexible fixturing platforms for the robots. We're aiming to design more adaptive and powerful tools perhaps switching from pneumatic to electric to get the torque behind the tool so we can do faster soaring and milling processes. We're then aiming to expand the range of products that the robot can actually dismantle, um, aiming to go towards more personalized electronic equipment, perhaps mobile phones and laptops. We're also aiming to develop vision systems to increase the automation of the robotic system. We're aiming to develop these systems so that we can, for example, place a, the component onto a conveyor belt which goes into the robot cell, the robot can identify the components, pick it up, orientate it on the platform, and then start disassembling it by itself. These are quite high ideas, as uh, if any of you are familiar with robotic assembly, they have numerous problems with their uh, vision systems and uh, making sure they behave themselves. So this is going to be quite an interesting next project. Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll see you the questions. Thank you.